So we are picking up our continued study of the spiritual life. We're looking at the meaning of spirituality. Tonight we're going to hit some material, uh, some very practical material, uh, with regard to spiritual disciplines. So this will really be a starting point for us to understand some of the disciplines that we will be facing in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, Last week we ended off on a quote by Dr. Charles Ryrie, which I will pick up with him. He said, and here I'm going to be quoting him, and this is from his book, uh, Dr. Ryrie's um, um, Articles, uh, that he has written. It's called Dr. Ryrie's Articles is the name of the book. And he says here that Christian maturity is the growth which the Holy Spirit produces over a period of time in the believer. And that is absolutely correct. And the element of time is a key element to spiritual growth, as it is to human development. Uh, you just have the element of time. It's, it's a necessary aspect. Ryrie goes on, he says, To be sure, the same amount of time is not required for each individual, but some time is necessary for all. He says it is not the time itself which is the, determinat- which is the, de- is the determinative of maturity, Rather, it is the progress made and growth achieved, which is all important, end quote. And that's correct. It's what do we do with the time and the opportunities that we have? Because every situation, every opportunity is, in fact, an opportunity to grow. It is, in fact, an opportunity to shine. Uh, It's an opportunity for us to look at that situation and to lay hold of it. Now, last week I talked a little bit about... Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 5, and, for, and James 1, 2 through 4, where there is a faith response to trials and tribulations. You know, James uh, 1, 2 through 4, he says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And that is a volitional aspect to the Christian life, where by faith you choose to count it all joy that you thank God in the trial, but you actually learn to thank God for the trial uh, because you understand its value. You understand that God is using that difficulty, uh, that trial, to refine you, to develop you spiritually, and that's part of the Christian life. But it requires a faith response, and feelings will flare up, and that can help cloud your thinking. Uh, But you have to be able to think through these problems. You have to be able to be able to take God's word and plug it in and have a faith response. Now, if you discipline yourself to pursue godliness, to pursue this walk with the Lord, if you if you choose that life, it's a very demanding life, uh, but it is also an extremely rewarding life. But you're going to have to be able to think through things, to be able to take the word of God and be able to plug it in to whatever situation you're in, whether you're on the road, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, wherever you happen to be, uh, that you can take the Word of God and you can apply it effectively. And it will stabilize you in your soul, but it will also allow you to be able to grow and to advance. So again, it's not the time itself uh, that brings about the growth. Uh, Much of it is what you are taking in because spiritual food is like natural food. Uh, it helps with the development of the of the person spiritually if they're taking in the Word of God because you can't live what you don't know. And I've said this a thousand times that learning God's Word necessarily precedes living God's will. And the more that you know, the more you have in your reservoir, in your bank of knowledge, of information that you can then take and apply to whatever situation you're in. So you have to learn it. Now, learning it is no guarantee that you'll live it, uh, because you can learn the word and not apply it. That's why James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. And James 4.17, which says, to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so it is possible to take in the word of God, but we're going to spend time talking about that aspect uh, of the difficulties we face. We're going to look at believers who failed. Uh, we're going to see believers who, uh, Solomon, we're gonna, probably going to spend a couple weeks on Solomon. Solomon's a fascinating study because he started out so well as a believer. We call him a true believer. He is, in fact, a saved individual. He's in heaven today. But by the end of his life, he completely turned away from the Lord. 
And this was a man that God gave wisdom to, answered his prayers, called him my son, and empowered him to serve as a king over Israel for 40 years, used him to build the temple in Jerusalem, a seven-year project, uh, used him to write three books of the Bible. And yet by the end of his life, he made some bad choices with regard to relationships. And friendships are very, very important. Who we choose as our friends is very very critical to our spiritual development. And I think of Proverbs 13, 20, one of my favorite passages, it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And Solomon was the one who wrote that, and yet he failed in that very regard because he he brought into his life all of these women uh, and practiced polygamy. We know by the end of his life he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's the world record as far as we know. Uh, But nonetheless, they began to influence him away from the Lord. And those relationships are very important in life. In fact, I've had to break relationships. I've had to cut ties with people who started out so well and then all of a sudden went south. And I've just had to say, look, I love you, but I love the Lord more. And my walk with him is more important than my walk with you. And I would encourage him. I'd say, come on. And they kept encouraging me to go in the way of the world. And finally, I just said, you know, got to cut that. You know, Proverbs 15, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad associations corrupts good morals. And so I had to be mindful of that. But we're going to look at, at examples of people who made the most of the time and made wise decisions and made wise decisions. And so that is part of the development that we have as Christians. So again, when Ryrie says it is not the time itself which is determinative of maturity, rather it is the progress made. And growth achieved, which is all important. Now going on in the notes here, as Christians, as the Christian learns and lives God's word by faith and yields to the Spirit's guiding, there will be a gradual transformation of character that will be seen in one's thoughts, values, words, and actions as they pertain to family, friends, work, finances, and social life. And so the point there is that the more you study the Word of God, the more you realize it speaks to the major areas of life. The Bible doesn't tell us everything about everything, but what God has revealed is what He deems important for us to know in the big areas of life. You know, what kind of car should you buy? Should you buy a car or truck? You know, should you buy a red car or a blue car? You know, should you get a V8 or a four-cylinder? You know, should you buy foreign or domestic? You know, I mean, those are all decisions. Now, some of that's predicated on pride. I know some people that will drive a Ford, never drive a Chevy. Lord help, they'll never buy a Toyota. Whereas I would buy a Toyota. It's a very reliable car. I'm not that, you know, I'm not that prideful. Uh, At least not in that area. Maybe other areas I have my failings. But, you know, the Bible doesn't speak to those issues. So it becomes very practical, you know, with regard to how you live your life. There's a lot of freedom there. You know, when do you marry? Do you marry? Do you have two children, four children, eight children? I mean, those are all personal decisions. Now, the Bible says that if you do marry, then it does speak to you as a husband and a wife. It also speaks to you as a child to your parent. tells you to honor your mother and father. And if you have children, well, all of a sudden you've got a new set of rules in the Word of God that now becomes applicable to you. That was not applicable before. So how your walk advances depends largely on what's going on in your life. What kind of issues are you dealing with? You know, what's new in your life? What new changes do you have? You know, do you have a new family member? But the point is, is that the Word of God will speak to those major areas of your life and influence really the whole of your life. Now, Wendell Johnston here, and I have a quote here, and uh, and I like uh, this reference here, and this is taken from the Theological Word Book. Uh, And this quote, this section here was by Wendell G. Johnston. This is page 334 and 335. Uh, I always put the footnotes in there that you can chase down that material if you want for yourself. He says, quote, people who are spiritual do certain things as well as refrain from certain things. He says they will express love to God without reservation, and they will love others in the body of Christ. He says they will even show love and graciousness to their enemies. Uh, Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment uh, because that's correct. And I can tell you the number of times that I have applied uh, Romans 12 uh, to to, uh, people that are hostile to me. Because Romans 12, uh, starting in verse 17, he says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Uh, Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. 
He says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Well, I can tell you that when I find myself in an unjust situation, my default mechanism is to say vengeance is mine, say it's steep. And, uh, and I want my pound of flesh. But I'm told not to operate that way. I have a clear directive from the Lord that, we, that I am never to take my own revenge, uh, but, uh, but to leave room for the wrath of God. In fact, he goes on, he says, But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so that becomes part of the directive. And so even dealing with people uh, that are our enemies, that are hostile to us, that we show them love, that we extend grace to them to the degree that we can. But his point here is that uh, spiritual believers will even show love and graciousness to their enemies. He goes on, he says, Spiritual people will seek to live according to the principles set forth in Scripture and desire to study the Word of God and put it into practice and put into practice what it says. He goes on, he says, They will seek to worship God individually and with other believers. He says, Spirituality will be expressed by proper, by, by pro- proper conduct in the home. And there he references Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4, by the way, that section in Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 9 uh, is what is commonly referred to as the household codes. Uh, because Paul, when he was writing, just like when Peter wrote, when you think about the first century church, the first century church met in homes. Uh, they didn't have buildings, large buildings. And you think about even if the home was a large home, you might be able to get 30, 40 people in there, maybe, maybe 50 if it was a big home. But the house churches were basically the, the starting point, and those, the, that's where people met. But when you think about people that came together in a household, you would have various uh, people there. You would have mothers, fathers, you would have children, you would have servants. And so when you read Ephesians 5, uh, 22, uh, through Ephesians 6, 9, you have the major uh, persons in the household. So like in Ephesians 5, 22, he, he, he talks to wives. But then in verse 25, he turns attention to husbands. Well, there he's talking about the basic unit of the of marriage. When you get down into Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, he addresses children. Well, that's very interesting because that would tell you that children were in in the church setting because these letters were often circular letters. Ephesians was probably a circular letter uh, that traveled from church to church. So somebody would come in and they would read the letter in the public setting. Well, when he's addressing wives, wives would have perked up and said, oh, he's, he's talking to me, you know, or if he addresses husbands, oh, he's, now he's talking to me. Well, all of a sudden when they start talking, you know, children, they say, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. All of a sudden the children would have perked up and said, oh, this portion is speaking to me and it's telling me how I am to conduct myself with regard to my parents. And then when you get down into verse four, now all of a sudden he's talking to fathers, well, you might have a newly married couple that don't have children, so you don't have a father and a mother yet. Maybe that's coming. But here you have an address that's made to the fathers in the home. So you're addressing children, then addressing fathers. Then he addresses household servants. Wasn't that interesting? And now all of a sudden the servants in verse 5, well, they would have perked up because they would have been part of the basic family unit uh, in that common household. And then he, uh, a little further down in verse 9, addresses masters. So you see how he's addressing the normal occupants of the home. And this is what is referred to as the household codes, this little unit of uh, this little pericope here. So again, what, what, uh, what Mr. Johnson here is talking about, when he's talking about being uh, put into practice, what it says, he's talking about how it's expressed across the board. So again, when he says spirituality will be expressed by uh, proper conduct in the home, here you see how it's addressing the various members of the home and the household church. He goes on, he says, and people who are spiritual will lead Christian, will, will lead Christ-like lives in society and will respect civil authority. Well, now he's jumping over to uh, 1 Peter 2, where he, the directive here is to submit uh, yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governor sent uh, by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
And notice he says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And so here we have uh, directives with regard to how we behave in society with regard to government. And these are things that we'll look at in greater detail as well. But you see how the advancing believer, that you will see certain aspects of his or her life that will become manifest as their character uh, becomes more and more in conformity with the will of God as it speaks to various aspects of life. And he closes out here. He says, they will live godly lives even in a hostile environment. And there he cites 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 13 to 17. Now, going on in the notes, furthermore, there is always opposition to spiritual growth. (laughs) We're going to spend quite a bit of time on this as well. And this is because we live in a fallen world and are confronted with many obstacles and distractions that seek to push or to pull us away from God. Uh, Now, there are these constant distractions. You think of 1 John 2, 15, where we're told, uh, do not love the world nor the things in the world. And he talks about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. And when he says do not love the world, and he uses the Greek word cosmos there, that's a word that appears about 183, 185 times in the Greek New Testament. Now, a few usages, maybe two usages that I'm aware of, uh, there may be more, but there's just a couple that I'm aware of where uh, the word cosmos refers to the physical planet. But by and large, the usage of cosmos refers to a system, And so there is an entire system that Satan has created, a system of values, a system of philosophies, and he has forces at work both in the unseen realm and the demonic realm. We're going to talk, spend some time talking about that. But there's also forces at work within uh, within society. And so we have a lot of these values being brought down via government, via academic institutions, uh, via news outlets, uh, through literature, through music. I was heavily influenced by music when I was a teenager, listened to a lot of heavy metal and punk rock music, and, you know, the content of a lot of that's very, very dark. And once that gets into your soul, that creates a state of depression, anger, Uh, and, you know, there was a time in my life back in the late 80s that I spent a year, you know, having suicidal ideation. And a lot of that came out of the culture that was part of the culture that I was in because a lot of comments were made about death and, and violence, and that was very much part of that, that heavy metal culture and, and, the, and the, the lyrics that were there. Well, you come into that, and you're confronted by that. And this is true even as a believer where we are confronted uh, with a lot of this world system because God doesn't suddenly, at the moment of salvation, pluck us from this world and take us to heaven. I mean, there would be nobody to share the gospel if that happened, right? Uh, But it's not the will of God that we be removed from this earth uh, immediately after we are saved, unless you're the thief on the cross. There There are the deathbed conversions. Those do happen. But God wants us to stay in this world. But we are not to be conformed to this world, uh, to Satan's world system. But we are to be transformed, and being transformed is being transformed from the inside out. And so we're going to spend some time talking about Satan's world system and what that looks like, and how it operates. We'll talk about the strategies that Satan employs. So these are things that we will look at. By and large, the battleground is the mind. The battleground is the mind. And so though constant distractions are all around us, we move forward, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, by destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And notice he says, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I've been wrestling the last couple days. This verse has been very, very applicable to me uh, because I had a bit of a jarring experience a couple days ago and it it kind of rattled me uh, mentally. I was tired. I wasn't ready for it. It sideswiped me. It, It sent me reeling and it took me a minute to recalibrate my thoughts and to uh, to recognize what was happening, and my of course my emotions. I love my emotions. You know, I, I often talk about them in a negative way because they they do get in the way sometimes. My emotions were clouding my thinking and was were not my friend in the moment. Um, but I love my emotions. But in that situation, it was actually a harm to me. And I find it interesting that when I when I get triggered emotionally, I can go from zero to a hundred in a nanosecond. But then it takes me anywhere from 20 minutes to two to three hours to, to taper off from that emotion. Isn't that funny how that works? That, that there's a cooling off time. But you can go from zero to 100 in like, like, a, like a split second. 
But again, that's understanding our basic makeup as human beings and understanding how not to respond or not to react to situations, but to respond. But part of that discipline process is learning to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And eventually I did. I came around. My thoughts came around. My emotions settled down. And uh, now I'm back in a good place. I'm very happy. Uh, the problem didn't go away, but that's all right. You know, you count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that it's producing something in you. And so you have a faith response, and eventually your emotions come around, and you're living and operating by the Word of God, and, and, it, and it works out. Now, bringing our thoughts into captivity means focusing our minds on God and His Word. And this is part of the discipline of the Christian life. Paul, uh, David writes in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, you've noticed I've highlighted three words there, walk, stand, and sit, because anything that you're doing in life, you're either walking, you're standing, or you're sitting, unless you're sleeping, then you're laying out. Uh, but here he's, he, these words uh, capture all of life is what it's intended to do. And these are things that we should not be doing. But, he says in verse 2, his delight, this is, this is the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, notice, and in his law he meditates day and night, day and night. And so the word law here translates the Hebrew word Torah, uh, translated law, it's a good translation, uh, but the word also means instruction or direction. Because it's speaking to that information that God has given that helps direct our thoughts, our words, our actions, our values. So his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And the word meditate here translates a Hebrew verb, hagah, which has to do with the filling of the mind. This, this is not an emptying of the mind or focusing on one thing to the exclusion of everything else to create this, this, uh, this, this peace in your mind. Uh, this is a focus upon God. This is a, a focus upon Him. And so uh, in His law, He meditates day and night. And I will tell you, I make it a point, a discipline as a matter of fact, to think Scripture all the time. And you can develop this over time. You can think, you can train your mind. It's, it's uh, Pavlovian, you know, you can, you can condition yourself, right? So you can, you can train your mind to just begin to think Scripture in various situations. But this is where we bring every thought into captivity. Isaiah 26, 3 says, The mind that is steadfast, uh, that is fixed on him, he says, You will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. I think it was the King James Version that I remembered it as, that the mind that is stayed upon thee shall be kept in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. And so when your mind is upon the Lord, you have that peace that comes from focusing upon him and realizing that he is, he is there, he is for you, he's with you to strengthen you, to protect you, to guide you, to give you what you need to be sustained in whatever situation you're facing. And, uh, but when your mind is on anything other than the Lord, then by your own decision you turn away from the thing which is stable, the thing that is constant. Jesus said in Matthew, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so with God and his word, you have two stable things uh, that will never change. And it gives you a fixed reference point for life, uh, such that when you can lock into that, when you can learn to train your mind to, to look to the Lord, then you can have that peace. Now, I've had to shut off the news, the TV. I've had to quit listening to talk radio, or I'll catch it for maybe 10 minutes. And, of course, it's all negative news. And, you know, the adage, if it bleeds, it leads. And that's all they do is they just, yeah, they just go from one, uh, one bad problem to the next. And they're always trying to catch some, you know, trying to give you some hook line, some catchy phrase. Uh, I had a professor years ago, and he studied journalism, and he talked about headlines that would catch people. And one of the ones that stuck with me, it was a famous headline from New York uh, from back in the 70s, I think. But the title was, A Headless Man Found in Topless Bar. And, uh, and, and those sort of catchy phrases, you know, are all intended to hook you to draw you in. And uh, this is all part of the marketing. It's all part of the psychology of that. And we have to be careful that we don't spend too much time in that because that's human viewpoint. I can listen to uh, conservatives and liberals battle something out and listen to both of them and realize they're both operating from human viewpoint, that there's no divine viewpoint in the discussion. And so I have to be mindful of these things. I have to be careful, again, about what I take into my mind. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all things, guard your heart. For from it flow the wellsprings of life. And so guarding your heart 
is a very important aspect of our spiritual walk. It's being careful about what we put into our minds. My grandmother used to liken the mind to a garden. She said, if left unattended, weeds will sprout, trash will, will blow in, and it'll look like a dump. Uh, but if you, if you pick up the trash, if you remove the weeds, if you plant beautiful things, then beautiful things will grow. And uh, the mind can be a very beautiful place, just like a garden, but it requires attention. And you have to be disciplined. You have to stay up on it. Of course, Proverbs th uh, 3, 5, and 6, very famous passage, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean in on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Here's a passage I referenced this morning in an article I just finished writing. Uh, Paul writes, he says, Therefore, if, and if there is a first-class condition in the Greek, so we might translate it since, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep, th keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Notice verse 2, set your mind where? On things above and not on things above that are on the earth. And so again, this becomes a discipline. You can know the truth, but then you must apply the truth. So uh, we are learning to focus our minds on God and his word, and we are not allowing our thoughts to be bogged down and trapped with the cares of this world. But this requires discipline, discipline. And this is a word that I will bring up time and time again. And you will hear me use this word over and over, and I'll probably use synonyms for it too, just to kind of shake it up so you're not bored to tears with it. Uh, but it is a word that is very, very important to the Christian life, discipline. In fact, I would argue that success in any area of life requires discipline. If you're going to be successful uh, academically, you have to have discipline. You have to attend class. You have to study. You have to listen. You have to take good notes. You have to uh, be willing to uh, get good rest so that when it comes time for test time, uh, you're not filled with uh, test anxiety, which I can, I can attest to that, okay? Um, I have a few nodding heads here as well, so we get that. It's, it's, a, it's a common culture. It's, it's common more among guys, I think, than gals, but that's all right. Uh, but I think that discipline is true to any aspect of life. If you're going to own and be successful in a business, it requires discipline of time, of money, of effort, uh, if you're going to be successful in the medical professional field, if you're going to be successful as an engineer. I mean, pick an area of life where you show me, where you, somebody is successful, and I will, show you, I will show you somebody who is disciplined, somebody who has taken the time to commit themselves uh, to the thing that they want to grow at. And the Christian life is that way too. In fact, I would argue that discipline is even applied and should especially be applied to marriage. And I have had to make it a point in my own life. I mean, I have a good marriage, but that requires discipline. It requires discipline of action, of thought, of word, of paying attention, uh, of giving time because what you value, you make time for. And if you say, I love you, but never make time for that person, well, that's a contradiction. Even children understand that concept. Um, but it becomes one of those things where it becomes a discipline. And, um, and so these are things that we'll talk about as well. The second thing I think that if, if, if you show me somebody who's mature, I will show you somebody who has, a certain, who has experienced a certain amount of suffering in life. Because I don't think you can really hit the heights of maturity as a human being, let alone as a, as a, as a Christian, until you have really faced suffering. And so it's just part of the human experience. But God can use that. He can use that to shape us and to mold us, and he will use that. And we're going to look at examples of that in the Bible. Now, often we like to maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain, but uh, we have to be willing to allow God to take us to the gym. We have to be willing to go through certain painful experiences because there are things that we will learn. By the way, when you go through those painful experiences, they are painful, they will mark you, but they can also equip you for ministry. They can equip you to minister to other people who will experience that suffering at a future time. I, I, a couple weeks ago, I was out visiting a client. I stopped by a, a client's house for what I thought was going to be a two-minute visit. And about 48, 50 minutes later, I'm leaving the front porch. But I was talking with a woman who was in her mid-60s who's helping, trying to help her mother uh, who has moderate to advanced dementia and doesn't know who she is from one day to the next. And uh, my years of dealing with my mother, uh, with her dementia by the end of her life, though it was a very painful experience for me and very, very taxing, 
uh, very taxing. Nonetheless, uh, I shared a lot of stuff with her, a lot of practical wisdom. And she was a believer. And so, you know, I, I saw the crosses on the wall and the scripture references. And I said, oh, you're a, you're a Christian. She said, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to throw some scripture in here, too. And I just had to do that. I can't, can't leave that out. And, uh, but, I, but by the end of it, I told her, I said, look, you don't like what you're going through. And I know that this is painful for you. She cried th- three times during our discussion. And she walked away with some useful information, things that I shared with her to help her on her journey of caring for mom. Uh, but by the time I left, uh, she looked at me and she said, you were exactly what I needed at this moment in my life. And the timing, well, it was providential, wasn't it? It was God orchestrating that event. Now, did I like what I went through? No, I didn't like the suffering. In the moment, you don't like it. You want it to go away. And, and you're very irritated by it. And it's very disruptive. But that thing that you learn to deal with, that coping mechanism that you learn in that situation, that weakness, that failure that gets exposed, that helps you to develop in certain ways, can then become the instrument of information that you can then impart to somebody else who is themselves struggling. And so it becomes an opportunity for ministry, and God can use you in those ways. And so these are things that are just part of our maturing. But discipline and suffering, these are things that we'll talk about in the... This is all preview of coming attractions. See, that's really all this is, just a big preview. I'm giving you introductory material on where we're going to be in the weeks and months ahead. But still very relevant. So let's talk about spiritual discipline. Spiritual uh, maturity is the product of a disciplined life that is consciously and intentionally surrendered to God on a moment-by-moment basis. Now, I've highlighted the word surrendered there because we're going to talk about surrendered. We're going to talk about dedicated. We're going to talk about committed. We're going to talk about loyal. We're going we're gonna to be hitting a lot of synonyms, and I'm going to keep repeating these words because next week when we jump into uh, our next section, we're going to be looking at dedication. And making that commitment, it starts at a point in time where the believer says, I am going to walk with you, Lord. It's a point of commitment. Now, you may have uh, failures along the way where you have lots of opportunity to apply 1 John 1, 9. I do on a daily basis. That's just me. I'm not going to confess my sins to you. You don't need to know what they are. But I confess my sins daily to the Lord. Uh, But it started with a point in time many years ago uh, when I decided I cannot keep living this life of, of the world, of Satan's world system. And uh, the Lord humbled me. You know, Hebrews twelve six says, He whom the Lord loves, he disciplines like a father his own son. And he scourges every son, pasawios, every child whom he receives. So if you live long enough, uh, you're going to get a scourging. Now, I've had a few in my life. Let me tell you, they're quite painful. But they're effective. They're effective. And I found myself literally waking up on the grass uh, where I'd slept next to some apartments the night before, and I was flat on my back in every possible way, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, and I had no place to look but was but up. And I did. I looked up. And at that moment, there was a turning. There was a turning that occurred in my mind. And there was a shift. I remember walking out on the street at 7 a.m. on Charleston Street and on the, on the park bench and watching traffic go by. And having a conversation with a homeless guy who pushed his cart up and sat down on the, next, on the bench next to me. And looked like he hadn't bathed in a few months. And uh, he was about my age, probably in his mid-50s. I turned 57 this month, so I feel like I'm getting old. Uh, but anyway, I'm talking to this guy, <clears throat> and um, he's yak-yakking about stuff, Reaganomics. I don't know what he's talking about. And, and I'm looking at this guy thinking, is this me? You know, am I going to be a homeless guy you know, talking to somebody on a park bench 30 years from now? And I just had just an aha moment, and I just thought, Lord, no, this, this can't be it. And, uh, and so at that point, I decided I need, I need to turn to Christ. And that was, the, that was the morning of my commitment. Now, I've had many failures along the way, but listen, relapse doesn't mean collapse. And so because you venture off the road, because you fall down, get up. And unless the Lord takes you out by death or by rapture, as long as you're breathing, even if you failed, as long as you're breathing, there's grace. God is extending grace to you. So get up, confess your sin, dust yourself off, lick your wounds, and move on. Get on with the Christian life. And eventually you'll get to the point to where you will sin less. You'll never be perfect in this life. That's not part of the Christian experience. That's when we leave this world and enter into heaven. But you will get to the point in your advancement to maturity where you will, in fact, sin less. 
and, uh, and I try to keep my sins small, and I try to keep my sins few. And some sins are big. Some sins will take you out, even under the Mosaic Law. Out of the 613 commands, there were about 15 that warranted the death penalty because not all sins are the same. We understand that even in, in, the, in, the, in the legal world of crime. I mean, murder is not the same as breaking the speed limit by five miles an hour. We understand that. And so as we advance in our walk with the Lord, we're going to have to deal with certain sins, and usually you deal with the big ones, the ones that will take you out. You've got to get those out of your life. You have to deal with those. I had to deal with drug addiction. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was a ship headed for an iceberg, and I had to cut the wheel real hard real quick, and a lot of stuff went crashing against the side of the ship, and we were leaning real hard one way. But whatever damage may have occurred within the ship, it was just collateral damage because you know avoiding the iceberg was the important thing. And so we make those big life decisions, and that has to happen on occasion. It happened with me, uh, and so eventually you will grow and mature. But the surrendered life, that moment-by-moment -moment basis, this is the walk of faith. Now, discipline is doing what we ought to do, whether we want to do it or not, because it's right. Now, that's really a direct quote from my grandmother, because uh, she was a very, very disciplined woman. And I she used to bat the word around with me when I was a little boy. And she'd say, have discipline, Stephen, have discipline. When you grow up, have discipline. And finally, I just one day, I, was, I was roll, rolled up to her and I said, Grandma, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I have no idea what you're I'm eight, you're 81. What in the world are you talking about? And she said to me, I'll never forget, she had a very apt way of saying things that just stuck in my head. She said, discipline is doing what we ought to do, whether we want to do it or not, because it's right. Man, the concrete was poured and it set quick. And that just stuck in my head. And I thought, okay, I get that. I understand that. I uh, didn't always live by it, but I understood it. And so I think that that is true throughout life. I think it's certainly true in the Christian life. Now, Christian discipline is living as God wants us to live, really as obedient to the word believers who walk by faith and not feelings. The proper Christian life glorifies the Lord, edifies others, and creates in us a personal sense of destiny that is connected with the God who called us into service. And you will find that uh, threefold language, I will employ that time and time again, that as we advance in our walk with the Lord, we advance in the Christian life, it will be a life that glorifies God. It is a life that makes God look good. That's what it is. It is a life that glorifies him. It is a life that edifies others. It is a sacrificial life. Listen, I was talking with a guy the other day at work, a, a good friend, a very bright guy. Like We have theological discussions. I like him. He's got, a, he's got a good mind. But we were talking about Christian fruit. And I said, fruit is a sign of maturity. Because if you take a new plant, a new sprout that's coming out of the ground, it doesn't have fruit. Fruit is the product of maturity. You've got to grow to maturity. But when a plant grows to maturity, the fruit is not for the plant's benefit. The fruit is for the benefit of others. And so as you begin to grow, you will produce fruit, but that fruit will be for the edification of other people. Whatever your spiritual gift is, maybe it's the gift of mercy, maybe it's the gift of administration, maybe it's the gift of giving, maybe it's the gift of teaching. You know, who knows what your gift is? It'll develop in time. As you grow, it'll, it'll come out. Uh, but it is one of those things where as you begin to grow and you begin to advance, it will glorify the Lord, it will edify others, and it will create within us that personal sense of destiny that is connected with the God who has called us into service and into a relationship with Him. And that personal sense of destiny is very profound in the Christian life because you will walk around every day knowing who you are as a child of God, as a brother or sister to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that you are part of the royal family, and that you have to stop thinking like a peasant, and you have to start thinking according to the royal family honor code, and you have to start abiding by that system of ethics that the Word of God sets forth, and you will realize who you are in Christ, and what exactly that means. And one day, it, it dawned on me that I have to carry myself like a child of God. That's a very high calling. We'll talk about that too. We'll talk about the high calling of the Christian life. Now, as we advance in our walk with the Lord, spiritual maturity is an important target, and this requires discipline of mind and will. Paul, when writing to his young friend Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Well, there we have it. So Paul writes, I'll read the whole, I'll read verses 7 and 8. He says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. He says, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, 
But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, Paul does not deny the benefit of bodily discipline, but when compared to godly discipline, he says it is only of little profit. The word godliness translates the Greek noun eusebia. Now, that's a word that we'll probably hit a few times in the future. But it translates the Greek noun eusebia, which denotes devotion to God and a life that is pleasing to him. I should have highlighted the word devotion there because that's really another word that we're going to see. Commitment, dedication, these are all words that we're going to see over and over again. But it denotes devotion to God and a life that is pleasing to him. It means we are concerned with what the Lord thinks about us and we consciously choose to live as he directs. And so another word that we'll hit is the word submission. That's another word that we'll hit. It's actually a military term. It derives from the Greek verb hupotasso, which means to rank under. And it means you recognize the authority of God uh, or the authority of a person over you. And there's authority structures all around us. Uh, I have an authority structure at my work. If my supervisor tells me to do something, I salute and say, yes, ma'am, ma'am, and off I go. If I, if I get pulled over by a police officer, that's a person in authority. He's an officer or she's an officer. That's a position of authority. If it's a governmental official, if it's a teacher in a classroom, that's an authority. If it's a coach on the field, if it's a coach, at a, that's an authority figure. It's somebody who has the right to direct you with regard to your practices. You know who has the most authority on a, on a field is, is, the, uh, is the referee because they can throw you out of the game. I mean, you want to talk about authority, they've got it. But there's authority structures all around us. Parents to children, that's an, that's an authority structure. And so we learn to think in terms of these structures. Now, R.B. Thiem, Robert B. Thiem Jr., he says, quote, Godliness is the virtuous manner of life that results from devotion to God. See, there's that word again, de devotion. So he says, Godliness is the virtuous manner of life that results from devotion to God, the lifestyle of the Christian growing in grace, relying on, on divine power, applying divine viewpoint to circumstances, and thereby fulfilling God's will and plan. Uh, end quote. Now that's correct, and we'll unpack that in the future here. Let's see some of the future lessons. We'll unpack a lot of this. Now Paul prioritizes declaring... Uh, he says it he says it is profitable that is godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come isn't that interesting because it also has value for the future life in fact we may even spend some time talking about christian rewards and do you know that crowns are rewards given to believers for certain acts of faithfulness not all christians get crowns Crowns are only given to certain believers who commit certain acts on their journey to maturity. Now, think about this. There's a scene in the book of Revelation where you have these saints in heaven who are casting their crowns before the Lord. Uh, well, you know what's very interesting to me about that is that these believers who have these crowns have a capacity to express themselves in a worshipful way that those who do not have crowns do not. And I don't know if you've thought about it, but the life you live now determines the capacity you will have to determine the Lord in eternity. And these are important things, you see. And so it has, it has value not only for the present life. Listen, it really does have value for the present life. I, I can tell you my whole life is a testimony to that. But it also has value for the life to come. And we often don't think about that. We don't think about how we live now is going to affect uh, our capacity for a walk with the Lord in eternity and even expressions of worship. And so these are very, very important things. And you'll begin to understand the value of godliness. Now, the word discipline in 1 Timothy 4, 7 translates the Greek verb gumnazo, which we bring into the English as gymnasium. The Greek word actually means to exercise uh, in your birthday suit. I, I made it nice there for you. But that's how the Greeks used to train. Uh, and, of course, it was a men's only club. They did, they did allow women to participate in, in the Olympics later in the years later. I don't know if they had too many protesting wives or children or something. But they did allow uh, some of the girls to run in the race. But they had to run dressed with one breast exposed. Now, where they got that 
where they got that practice from, don't no, I don't know that anybody knows. But it was kind of bizarre. But that's what they did. Uh, but the, but it derives. It comes into the English for the English word gymnasium. Now, in secular use, it referred to how athletes trained in the ancient world, buffeting their bodies to improve their physique, that they might have a chance at winning in a sport. However, in the New Testament, the word was used of training one's mental and spiritual abilities. Now, when I came to realize that I have the gift of teaching, uh, I had an obligation at that point to really uh, study the Word of God. And I felt compelled within myself to go to school to study the Bible and to go on to get a master's degree and to study Greek and Hebrew, four years of each, and to study theology and philosophy and history and, and theological councils. And you study all these things and you spend a, a lot of money. And by the grace of God, I got some scholarships that paid for half of it. So that was good and work could pay for the rest. And then you have to invest in a library. And that usually runs about forty or $50,000 if you want a half decent library. But a library are like tools for a mechanic. I have a brother-in-law who's a mechanic up in Lubbock and he's got so many tools. I bet he's got over a hundred grand in tools. And I was talking with him about it one day and he said, look, he said, I don't know what kind of, what kind of job is going to roll in into the shop. He said, but I have to be prepared for whatever comes in. And he said, I have to have a number of books that I can read and manuals to consult. And he said, and then I have to have the tools to do the job. And that resonated with me because I have to have the tools to do the job. So you have to have a lot of these books. Then you have to dedicate time, and you have to study, and then you have to write, and hopefully it's legible. Hopefully somebody's not going to nitpick it and say, oh, gee, there's a split infinitive, and there's a run-on sentence, and there's a comma splice, and that's where I have my good wife, who's my editor-in-chief, and she will, if you've ever seen my notes at the end of the day, they just bleed dripping red, and when I first used to give them to her, I used to cry when she'd hand them back to me, and, and, uh, and I would hand them to her with trembling hands, like, please be gentle, and she'd be like... Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And, and, uh, and, but it came out good. Now I can't live without her because, uh, uh, I get to the point to where I don't want to post anything until she's read it two or three times. And we've gone back and forth and she's proofread it for grammar. And we have some vibrant discussions too. I, I, she's brilliant at it. I love her for that. But it is one of those things where once you learn you have the gift, then you have to develop it. And God gave me opportunity to exercise my gift of teaching. Uh, so it requires training one's mental and spiritual abilities. The focus is on inward development of mind and character rather than the outward enhancement of the body. And the discipline is to be ongoing. In the Greek, it's in the present tense, which speaks to ongoing action. And it is to be carried out by each believer. So as you grow in your spiritual walk, listen, don't worry about what your spiritual gift is. These spiritual gift tests, I've never understood the value of them. Maybe they work. I don't know. But uh, they're, a, they're a modern invention. But listen, as you grow spiritually, you'll get your gift will manifest. If you've got the gift of giving, then what happens is, is God will give you the capacity uh, to be able to make money. He'll, he'll, he'll give you the capacity, he'll give you the skills, the mental acumen uh, for business, for economics, whatever you need to be successful in the business world so that you can then exercise your gift of giving. If you've got the gift of teaching, same thing. If you have the gift of mercy, God will exercise that. Now, I don't have that gift. I see somebody trip and fall, I laugh. Uh, mercy is not my gift. I'm sorry, it's not. Uh, now, that's not to say that I'm not merciful. I'm just kidding there, obviously. Uh, but, uh, but other people, you know, they just naturally have that gift of mercy. It's, they're, they're, just, it's, they're just wired that way. But it is, uh, it is uh, the discipline is to be ongoing, present tense, carried on by each believer. That's active voice, means the believer produces the action of the verb. And it is to be executed as a directed by the Lord. It's in the imperative mood. And remember, the imperative mood... Uh, says at least three things. It says, one, that a person has the intellectual capacity to understand the directive. Two, that a person has the volitional capacity to obey the directive. And three, it demands present and or future opportunity because you cannot command past action. Uh, now, Paul, for Paul, godliness does not ha happen accidentally, but as 1 Timothy 6.3 uh, that it is connected with the teaching that promotes godliness. It's connected with the teaching. So if you're going to live the godly life, you have to have teaching. You see, you'd have to, you have to have school. That's what this is. This is education. This is, this is getting your degree in Bible. Uh, Titus 1.1 1, 1 says uh, that the knowledge of the truth, which leads to godliness. So again, you have to have a base of knowledge whereby you can live it out. So it is learned and lived on a daily basis. Now, the disciplined Christian develops over time as biblical thinking leads to righteous acts, 
and righteous acts develop into godly habits, and godly habits develop into godly character. To put it in a simpler way, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. But you see that there's a logical flow from that, but it all starts with sowing into the mind. The thoughts, the actions, the character, you know, developing those habits over time. And it ultimately develops in this godly character, which affects your personal destiny. Now, spiritual disciplines bring us to the place of spiritual uh, maturity, which is what God desires from us. We are to press on to maturity. That is, that is uh, one of the main directives. Now, the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 5.14 references mature believers when he says solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So maturity here translates the Greek adjective teleos, which denotes one who has attained a level of spiritual growth, which is witnessed in the daily application of God's word. Mature Christians are what they are because of practice and training. The word practice translates the Greek noun hexis, which according to Lonida, refers to a repeated activity, practice, doing again and again, doing repeatedly, end quote. Now, I learned that years ago, that I had to show up for class, that I had to listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, today, they're called back in the day, they were just cassettes you ordered uh, that came in the mail. And, uh, and I would listen faithfully to these Bible lessons over and over and over and over and over. And it's the same even when you're learning a language. Like when I was learning the Greek verb paradigm, luo, lue, sue, luamen, luetu, lusi, luso, luse, luse, lusamen, lusete, lususi. And you say that 8,000 million times and you have that paradigm just running through your head. I was having nightmares about the Greek verb paradigms and noun declensions. And it was just, you know, and, uh, and so anyway, but just that repetition. But it's the same thing. With the word of God, you study, you study, you study, and it's just through that repetition. And you know you've learned something when you can't forget it. I mean, when it's really grilled into your thinking, uh, you know you've really learned it. Now, the word trained, again, translates the Greek verb gumnazo, which according to Lonida means to experience vigorous training and control, to train, to undergo discipline. Now, the advancing Christian eventually reaches a place of maturity where he or she is able to discern good and evil. Thomas Constable says here, and I found this quote interesting, he says, a person becomes a mature Christian not only by gaining information, uh, though that is foundational, but by using that information to make decisions that are in harmony with God's will. So it has to have that application aspect to it. I have a quote here by Arnold Fruchtenbaum, a man that I reference quite a bit. His material is quite good. He says, quote, a mature believer is one who is a full age spiritually. For the Greek word for full-grown men is goal. He says a mature believer has attained the goal of his spiritual life because he did apply what he knew and was therefore open to learning more. You see, it's always reaching up. He says here spiritual maturity is a result of careful exercise. Now, I hate exercise, I'll be honest, but I have to do it every day. It has to be a discipline. Again, it goes back to doing what you ought to do, whether you want to do it or not, because it's right. It's part of that discipline. He says, uh, he goes on, he says, full-grown men, uh, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. He says, a mature believer has the ability to make responsible decisions. The obligation of verse 14 is for all believers to make proper use of what they know. He says, usage of the word causes believers to progress from immaturity to maturity. Did you catch that? Usage of the word, that is putting it into practice, causes believers to progress from immaturity to maturity. Do you want to grow up? Learn the word, apply the word, and learn to apply it as broadly as you can. As you take it in, you apply it. But it's only that usage that will lead you to that place of maturity. A lack of usage means regressing from maturity to immaturity. By the way, the bolding there was uh, mine. I highlighted that. Warren Wearsby, another man that I like, he says, As we grow in the Word, we learn to use it in daily life. As we apply the Word, we exercise our spiritual senses and develop spiritual discernment. He says it is a characteristic of little children that they lack discernment. That's true, isn't it? He says a baby will put anything into its mouth. 
He says an immature believer will listen to any preacher on the radio or television and not be able to identify whether or not he is true to the scriptures. Just as our physical bodies have senses without which we could not function, so our inner spiritual man has spiritual senses. He says, as we feed on the word of God and apply it in in daily life, our inner spiritual senses get their exercise and become strong and keen. Paul called this process exercising ourselves unto godliness. So again, it's part of that process of being committed to learning the word, to living the word, and to applying it to whatever situation you're in. As growing Christians, we understand that God's word is the standard for right thinking and conduct. Uh, Right thinking, that's called orthodoxy. Right conduct, that's called orthopraxy or right living. So learning and living his word by faith is the key to spiritual advance. That is the key. Now, as a growing Christian, I want to be wise in the ways of God and his word, but this requires commitment. See, there's that word again. And I've highlighted that word because that's what we're going to focus on next week when we get into this. We're going to look at uh, commitment, loyalty, devotion, dedication, We're going to see these words over and over again, but this requires commitment and many choices throughout life. I realize that the wise are wise by choice and never by chance. And that is a truth for life, that the wise are wise by choice and never by chance. Uh, Now, the opposite is true as well, that the fool is a fool by choice and never by chance because volition is at the heart of a successful life or a failed life. It's what do you do with it. So this, that is, no one is accidentally wise. And of course, this is also true for being just, loving, gracious, kind, and merciful. For these and other godly virtues are the product of many good choices over years of practice. I have had to learn to be uh, patient with some people. And I tend not to be a patient person, but see, God, that's an area of weakness for me. So God says, all right, Steve, we're going to take you to the gym. Uh, It's like the woman who was, uh, you know, in her car and the air conditioner wasn't working and it was 112 out in Texas, Houston heat. And and, uh, she had uh, three kids in the back seat screaming and two up front. And she looked up and she said, Lord, give me patience. God gave her three more kids, just like the one she had, uh, and, uh, and raised the temperature a couple degrees. Because it's something that is developed over time. And you have to be trained in it. And this is just the thing. And if God is wanting to develop you in a certain area, he will put you in tests in those areas. I found years ago that I I failed apparently quite a bit in people tests. And God decided to put some uh, despicable people in my path. And I prayed for the Lord to remove those people from my life, like Paul's thorn in the flesh. I didn't pray three times. I prayed 300 times. But I also lived in the reality that what God does not remove, he intends for me to deal with. And so I looked at those people and I said, all right, God, I don't like that. That's a, that's a, it just, it's very upsetting to me, Lord. These people greatly upset me, but I trust you. I trust that you are in control of my life. So I thank you for these people. And I had to, boy, I'll tell you, it was a real walk of faith for me. I never grew so much in my life, but I developed and I learned certain truths that I could apply to various people situations. Now I've grown. I've earned a graduate degree by golly. And, uh, and so, you know, now he's going to put some other area of test in my life, some other area where I need to grow. And so God will develop me in some other place. But again, these are the product of many good choices over years of practice. I'm going to go a few minutes over. Bear with me. Now, the successful Christian life starts with positive volition. Jesus said, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. The word willing translates the Greek verb thelo, which according to Lonida means to desire, uh, to have an experience uh, or experience something, a desire or want to wish. To be willing to know and do God's will is the starting place for our advance to maturity. See, and there I'm talking about positive volition. That's just another word for loyalty, commitment, devotion, dedication. See, I'm already starting to get these words into your thinking. Now, our next step is to dig into God's word and to, and to learn it. Jeremiah expressed positive volition when he said, Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. A psalmist wrote, How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And Psalm 119.72 says, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Peter wrote, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you might grow in respect to your salvation. So learning God's word serves as the basis for right living. And once we learn it, we must walk in it, which means applying it to our lives, and this by faith. 
You see, it goes back to that everyday experience. Ezra is a good example of a believer who learned and lived God's word in Ezra 7.10. It says that Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. You see, it wasn't just enough to learn it, but to practice it, because uh, your life becomes a testimony. How you live, how you conduct yourself uh, becomes ob observable to others. So when it states that Ezra had set his heart, it meant that he had positive volition and was determined to learn and live God's word. This is the proper order. Again, it's always you learn it, and then you live it. When a Christian has a right will, that's called orthotheli, and operates with right thinking, that's called orthodoxy, it establishes the basis for right behavior, orthopraxy. See, you're learning some words. Your vocabulary is already expanded. Uh, isn't that great? I, it took me a while to figure something. I heard my professor sometimes repeat words. I'd be like, what in the world is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Not a clue. So positive volition, uh, divine viewpoint thinking, <laughs> And the walk of faith are what the Lord desires from us. And when these are present, maturity will be achieved. It's just a matter of testing and time. And God will test you. Life, listen, you may not, I don't like tests, but that's welcome to Christianity. Okay? You're going to have it. All right, so that closes out lesson number four. That's been four hours we have spent on just introductory material. We probably could have spent more time, but that's enough. You, you get the idea.